Welcome ladies and gentlemen to lecture number six where I'm going to look at the past paper for November 2018. For the past five lectures I have looked at past papers for November 2017, June 2018, June 2019 and November 2019. So the only paper which was remaining out of this new curriculum was the November 2018. So at the end of this paper, we will have completed all the past papers which have been written since the beginning of this new syllabus. So if there's anybody who has not yet listened or watched the other five previous lectures, feel free to contact me so that we can make arrangements so that you can access them and be on the same level as those who were having access to them from day one. So in this November 2018 paper, I'm going to focus on section D in detail. So section D, normally in an examination, this is a section where you're supposed to choose two questions out of three. And these two questions, they have a total of hundred of 200 marks whereas the other preceding section section a b and c they have a cumulative total of 100 marks so it is very important that students score very well in section d as it contains two-thirds of all the weight for this paper without taking much of the time i'll introduce my name my name is stanley samsoza and i'll be taking through this past paper. Now, section D, question one. You are working in labor ward and suddenly you discover that women are being examined in full view of relatives. You have reported the issue to the in charge who has not resolved the problem. You then decide to advocate for the patients who may not express themselves. Question 1A. Define advocacy. Define advocacy. The, I have two different definitions on advocacy. The first one is the easy one, which is easy to remember, which is this is the act of speaking on the behalf of or in support of another person, place or thing. This is the act, act of speaking on the behalf of or in support of another person, place or a thing. The other definition that I have for advocacy is advocacy is an activity by an individual or a group which aims to influence decisions within political, economic and social systems and institutions. So advocacy is an activity by an individual or a group which aims to influence decisions within political, economic, and social systems and institutions. Now, when we talk about advocacy, advocacy can include any activities uh, that a person or organization undertake. And uh, it includes media campaigns, public speaking, commissioning and publishing research, or conducting exit poll, or the filing of an amicus brief. So this is just a brief on advocacy. Then we move on to the other part of the paper. Part 2A. Identify four cooperating partners working with the Ministry of Health and explain their possible areas of collaboration. Identify four cooperating partners working with the Ministry of Health and explain their possible areas of collaboration. Now, we have so many partners which are working with the Ministry of Health, and the first one that I'll talk about is the United States Agency for International Development. The United States Agency for International Development, which is also called USAID, USAID which is USAID. Now, this is an international cooperating partner for Zambia, and it collaborates with the Ministry of Health 
by providing financial support in the, implement in, in the implementation of health programs such as the prevention and the treatment of HIV and AIDS. It is an international cooperating partner. It collaborates with the Ministry of Health by providing financial support in the implementation of health programs such as prevention and the treatment of HIV and AIDS. The second one that we have is the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, also known as CDC. CDC works in partnership with the Ministry of Health of Zambia to help them increase their capacity for leading and managing HIV and AIDS programs. It also supports the ministry by reinforcing staffing through recruitment and paying of health personnel on contract basis. So CDC, it supports the Ministry of Health by employing some people on a contract basis so that they can assist the few uh, health professionals that we have in the country. The third one is the Church's Health Association of Zambia. The Church's Health Association of Zambia, also known as CHAS. It was formed in 1970 by the Catholic and Protestant Church Health Institutions. It is the largest non-governmental health provider in Zambia. And it provides health services through church-based health institutions. So this is where we have mission centers and mission hospitals providing health service to the, to the public of Zambia. Number four, we have what is called Society for Family Health. Society for Family Health. It is a non-government organization that focuses on supporting national public health programs that reduce the HIV and AIDS prevalence rate through HIV prevention initiatives, improving access to family and reproductive health services, and increasing maternal and child survival through social marketing to promote quality products and healthy behavior practices. Then the fifth one that we have of the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting Services it is a government organization that collaborates with the Ministry of Health in the area of disseminating health information through radio and television to create public awareness. Now, when you look at the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, if you have looked at the previous pandemic that we have, COVID-19, you find that most people have been receiving information on their televisions as well as on their radios. But we also have other cooperating agents, for example, uh, even in the Ministry of Information and Broadcasting, we also have uh, cell phone providers also sending in some tips and uh, some advice on how we can stay safe during this pandemic. We have other cooperating agents that are just state without explaining much. We've got the World Bank, which also finance health programs. We've got the United Nations Development Program, UNDP. We support development programs in Zambia. We also have the International Monetary Fund, IMF, which gives access to finance to government of Zambia, which enables it to finance health programs. Also, we have a European Union and African Development Bank. So these are just examples of the cooperating partners who are working with the Ministry of Health uh, in supporting their different activities. Then we look at the other part of the question, which says, Explain five qualities of an advocator. Explain five qualities of an advocator. Now, an advocator, the first one that I'll talk about, an advocator is supposed to have good communication skills. An advocator must have good communication skills in order to both get information and disseminate it to the two parties. He or she must be a good listener in order to carefully analyze information given to them and must be a good speaker in order to argue convincingly. So it is very, very important for an advocate or for a person who is doing advocacy to have good communication skills. The second point is they are supposed to be knowledgeable. An advocate must gather enough information about the client and the other party, which will act as a basis for negotiations. Lack of knowledge can lead to, can lead to miss. Uh, presentation of facts and unsuccessful negotiations. The third one is good judgment. The ability to draw reasonable, logical conclusions or assumptions from limited information is essential to an advocate. This will enable him or her to look at issues objectively 
as he or she advocates for the client. So good judgment is the third point or another quality of being a good advocate. The other fourth point is accommodating. If you want to be an advocate, you're supposed to be accommodating. This is being eager or willing to help other people, for example, by changing one's plans. An advocate must be able to accommodate both the client and the other party in order to strike a balance. The other quality is a good advocate must be approachable. An advocate must be friendly in order to be approachable by clients. This quality will enable the clients to open up and present their issues freely. And then an advocate is also supposed to be empathetic. They're supposed to have empathy, which is our number six. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. It is a form of communication which involves listening to the client, clarifying their concerns, and communicating this understanding to the client. The other point, I will just mention it, is patience. If you are to be an advocate, you need to be patient with the people that you help. So these are some of the qualities that we have. The others that I'll just also mention in passing without explaining, an advocate is supposed to be helpful, supposed to be problem solving. So these are the other two extra qualities that we have of a good advocate. Then we move on to the other question. Explain the five elements of advocacy. The first element that we have of advocacy, uh, and the advocacy one has to build and maintain trust. It is a very, very crucial element that if someone is to be an advocate, they need to develop and build trust. Another element, number two, the other element of advocacy is expect conflict to reach consensus. On this point, a conflict and a fight are not the same thing. Conflicts are normal and require factual pushbacks in business, whereas fights are emotional, often personal disagreements which do not lead forward to consensus. The third element is embrace change. Change is the only constant in business. So it is important that it can also be used as a competitive advantage. It is important to initiate change rather than react to it and give clear instructions to help the team understand why the change is necessary and how it will make the situation better. So this is another important element of advocacy, which is embracing change. The fourth element is to improve your self-awareness. Too often, how we see ourselves differs from how we truly are and how we are perceived by others. If you are unclear on what you want and need from others, you really find it and can lead others to help you. The fifth one is, the other element is make decisions. In general, any decision is better than no decision. Usually, a blended approach is the best between independent decisions and collaborative decisions factoring in the best team input. Picking great team members is a required first decision. So these are some of the five elements of advocacy that we have. But I'm also going to give you other additional ones without much explanation. The other sixth uh, element that we have is attitude and emotions. It's important. And also the seventh one is flexibility. Eighth one is determination. Ninth one is creating a paper trail. And the tenth one is knowledge. So it is important for an advocate to have these elements. Then we move on to part D. 
state six rights of the patient that you will consider during the process of change. State the six rights of the patient that you will consider during the change process. Now, the six that we have, these rights, if you go to any hospital, uh, I will always give an example of UTH, uh, CDH, where if you look at their door, they have always put the rights of the patients on the wall. So in coming up with the rights uh, of the patient that you consider during change, you have to draw them from the Bill of Rights of Patients. And I'll just mention and explain this. Number one, right to confidentiality, human dignity and privacy. Patients have the right to confidentiality, human dignity and privacy. Therefore, healthcare providers should observe strict confidentiality of a patient's condition with the only exception of potential threats to public health. Physical examination must be done under conditions that promote privacy and human dignity. The second one is right to informed consent. Right to informed consent. Patients have the right to be asked for their informed consent before submitting to potentially hazardous treatment. Healthcare providers should clearly explain the risks from receiving the treatment and only administer the treatment after getting explicit written consent from the patient. The third one, right to safety and quality care according to standards. Hospitals must ensure a hygienic and sanitized environment to provide their services in a conducive environment. The fourth one, right to be heard and seek redress. Patients have the right to provide feedback and comments to their health service providers and file complaints as required. They additionally have the right to redress up in cases where any of their judgments are violated. The fifth one is right to respect and non-discrimination. Patients have a right to considerate, respectful care from health care, from health that does not discriminate against them based on race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sex, age, mental or physical disability, sexual orientation, genetic information, or a source of payment. And the sixth one, right to take part in treatment decisions. Patients have the right to know their treatment options and take part in decisions about their care. They have the right to ask about the pros and cons of any treatment, including no treatment at all. Seventh one, right to choice of providers and plans. Patients have the right to choose healthcare providers who can give you high quality healthcare when they need it. And the last one, right to refuse or accept treatment. Patients have the right to accept, it, to accept or choose healthcare providers who can give them high quality service care when they need it. So in this area, if a patient says, I don't want to be treated, this is where we allow them to fill in the llama where we say it's living against medical advice. So all these things are rights that we are supposed to adhere to when we work with our patients, even to consider during the change process. Now we move on to our number two. Number two which goes like you are working at a health center where you are involved in rendering health curative and preventive services in offering both services you have to depend on effective communication and teamwork with fellow health workers and the consumers of the health services. Question 1. Define communication. 5%. The definition that I have here is communication is a process by which information is exchanged between individuals through a common system of symbols, signs, or behaviors. I will repeat. Communication is a process by which information is exchanged between individuals 
through a common system of symbols, signs, or behaviors. 2A2. Outline any two types of communication. Outline any two types of communication. The two types of communication that I have is one, verbal communication, and two, non-verbal communication. For verbal communication, it can either be oral or written. And for non-verbal communication, it can either be through facial expression, gestures, or body languages. So the two types that I've decided to give you to give you are the verbal and non-verbal communication. In other books, you find that they might give you a type of communication as formal and informal. Yes, that is another classification and another way you can also put it across. Part 2b. Explain five barriers of communication, giving an example of each. Explain five barriers of communication, giving an example of each. The first barrier to communication is filtering. Filtering. Now, filtering is a deliberate manipulation of information to make it appear more favorable to the receiver. It's a deliberate manipulation of information to make it appear more favorable to the receiver. For example, you've been given an assignment to do to record vital signs for a patient. You find that there is a problem in the vital signs that you've recorded, but then you decide not to give a true information on what you have obtained. Number two, emotions. Emotions can be a barrier to communication. Emotions, this is how the receiver feels when a message is received and it influences how he or she interprets the message. As you are aware, when we are very emotional, you find that sometimes we miss on communication because we end up not listening, but we end up following what our emotions are saying. Number three, Information overload. It can also be a barrier to communication. Now, with information overload, uh, we have majors have a lot of meetings, email messages, calls, faxes, uh, professional reading. Uh, these make them have more information than they can process. So they tend to ignore, forget, or select or choose some information. So sometimes when a lot of information is presented to an individual, it can be a barrier to communication because they have to process a lot of information at the smallest time available. The fourth one is defensiveness. Defensiveness can be a barrier to communication because when people feel threatened, they tend to react in ways that hinder effective communication and this reduces their ability to achieve mutual understanding and they become defensive verbally, attacking others and making sarcastic remarks or being judgmental. So being defensive can also be a barrier to effective communication. The fifth one is language differences. So language differences and the difficulty in understanding and familiar accents can also be a barrier to communication. The sixth one is expectations and prejudice, which may lead to false assumptions or stereotyping. People often hear what they expect to hear rather than what is actually said and jump to incorrect conclusions. And the seventh one is cultural differences. The norms of social interaction vary gradually and greatly in different cultures, as do the way in which emotions are expressed. For example, the concept of personal space varies between cultures and between different social settings. So these are some of the barriers that we have, uh, barriers of communication. Part C, outline five characteristics of effective teams. Outline five characteristics of effective teams. The first character that we have is an effective team has clear goals. An effective team has clear goals. 
clear goals they are necessary so that all team members understand the purpose and the vision of the team. So clear goals are the first characteristics. The second one is defined goals. In defined goals, each team member understands their job function. So if each team member understands their job function, it actually makes the team more effective. The third one is open and clear communication. Open and clear communication can contribute to the effectiveness of the team as this keeps the team informed and focused. Fourthly, effective teams have effective decision-making. When decisions are made very well, you find that teams are more likely to perform much better in a more effective way and manner. Then the fifth one is balanced participation. All effective teams have all, team, all of their team members participating in a balanced manner. So balanced participation is one key element in effective teams. Part D, with the aid of a well-labeled diagram, describe the communication process. With the aid of a well-labeled diagram, describe the communication process. Now, the communication process is eight stages, and in the next slide, you're going to see the diagram that shows the flow of information. But we have at first the sender. The sender is the person who wants to communicate. And secondly, we have the message. The message is the information the sender wishes to communicate. Then we have what is called encoding. Encoding, this is how the message is to be communicated, for example, verbally or written. So basically, encoding is putting the message in a format that can be transferred where the receiver, when they receive it, they have to decode the message. Then we have what's called the channel. The channel is how the message is sent. For example, it can be face-to-face -face or by an email. Then we have the receiver. This is the person to whom the sender sends the message. And then lastly, we have decoding, which is how the receiver understands or interprets the message. A very good example is when you want to communicate via email. What do you do? You press on the buttons on the keyboard of your laptop or computer. They are going to type and make words. Using which language? English, Tonga, Nyanja, or any of the languages. The other person, when they receive them, they are going to read what has been written down as well as decode or make meaning of the message which has been forwarded. So I'm going to show you, you're going to see the diagram of the communication process. It is very important as students that you should be able to draw this diagram and interpret it as correctly as is possible. And even when they say describe the communication process, even if they don't ask you to draw, just quickly jot it as the diagram can help you to understand as well as recall easily. So following is the diagram that you are supposed to know by heart. As we move on to the diagram on part D, you need to look closely on how it is. As you can see, we have the sender, we have the message, we have encoding, channel, receiver, and we have what is called encoding. And you find that from decoding, which is like at the end of the channel, we have what is called feedback. And the feedback, it goes back to the sender. So communication is complete only if feedback has occurred and the center has acknowledged that the receiver has received and understood the message. But in the process of the communication process, we also have what is called noise. As you can see in that red star, what is noise? These are the different factors which can affect the transmission of the message and these factors can include psychological noise 
which are our perceptions and our stereotyping in our minds. The other noise that we have is physical noise, which is the atmosphere, where people are making noise in the background. And then the third one is environmental noise. This is the sounds that are outside in the environment. And we also have what is called semantics noise. This is where a person uses jargon. For example, a nurse who is trying to explain to the patient using medical terminology and not simplifying it. So these were the expected answers in question two that involved communication systems. Now we move on to question number three, which is on delegation. The first part to the question reads. So on question three, you have different levels of nursing staff, including the support staff under your care. And you need to make use of them in order to ensure that you achieve the goals for your ward. Question A. Define delegation. Define delegation. Delegation is the assignment to another person of formal authority and responsibility for carrying out specific activities. It is the assignment to another person of formal authority and responsibility for carrying out specific activities. It is a process through which a manager assigns responsibility to the subordinate to carry out work on his behalf. So you need to remember this definition. It is the process through which a manager assigns responsibility to the subordinate in order for them to carry out work on their behalf. Part B. One. Outline the five principles of delegation. Outline the five principles of delegation. The principles of delegation are derived from the five rights of delegation. The principles of delegation are derived from the five rights of delegation. The five rights to delegation from the perspective of both nursing service administrator and staff nurses are number one, right task, number two, right circumstance, number three, right person, number four, right direction or communication, and number five, right supervision or evaluation. Now looking at first one, the right task. Effective delegation begins with the manager defining his or her responsibilities. This involves writing down all of his or her activities and responsibilities and reviewing the master list and categorizing all of the items into two secondary lists. Things which the manager alone must do and things that others could do or help you complete. Anything that falls into the second list presents an opportunity for delegation. So what is important is for a manager to be able to write down tasks, which are the things that you as a manager you can do and which are the things that don't necessarily need you to do, you write them on another list. So those things which are not as much important to you, you can delegate them for others to do on your behalf as you focus on the critical things. Number two, right circumstances. The reason for delegation must be genuine, such as to train and motivate subordinates, reduce workload and promote efficiency. A manager must not delegate his or her duties for wrong reasons or circumstances such as not just wanting to work. So you need to delegate work using right circumstances you find that some managers, they end up delegating jobs so that them they rest, which is wrong. You are supposed to delegate things which will motivate your staff and not demotivate them. Number three, choosing the right person to delegate the task to or the right person. The manager must select a right subordinate to do the job, taking into consideration the skills, 
the knowledge, the attitude, and the position of the subordinate. So you as a manager, you are supposed to delegate to those people who are capable of doing the job. You cannot delegate a job to somebody who has just started nursing today. You need to delegate somebody who is partially experienced in that specific task. Number four, clarifying the desired results or right direction or communication. The results expected to be achieved must be clearly explained to the subordinate. When the results are clear, it allows the subordinate to use his or her own creativity and resources to accomplish the task. An added benefit of effective delegation is the individual may find a better and more effective way to accomplish the task or achieve the desired results. So when we delegate tasks to our uh, subordinates, we are supposed to clarify what we expect them to do, what results are they supposed to give, which direction are they supposed to take. And we need also to give them the flexibility for them to make decisions. Not that you delegate a task to a subordinate, but still you don't give them the authority. And this is explained in point number five. Clearly defining the employee's responsibility and authority as it relates to the delegated task, that is the right direction or the communication. The manager must clearly communicate the responsibilities and the authority and timeline. The manager must be sure that the subordinate has understood the responsibility and authority assigned to him or her. So here what I'm saying is when you delegate a task, you need to give them, these employees, the responsibility and the authority. And you need to clearly communicate this responsibility to them to say they are allowed to do A, B, C, D. So they should be able to make decisions, not to say you delegate a task to them, but still they cannot make decisions. Then we have the sixth one or an extra one, which is monitoring process which is the right supervision or evaluation. This can be achieved by conducting follow-up meetings. The follow-up meetings should be focused on monitoring progress and determining the need for assistance. The number of follow-up meetings will vary based on the scope of the task or a project and whether the subordinate is new or a long-term member of the department. So it is when you as a manager delegate a task to subordinate, the responsibility will remain with you the person who has delegated it. So basically what I'm saying is you carry the risk and the burden of making sure that the task is done to completion. Then we move on to part number two. Explain four advantages and four disadvantages of delegation. Now the four advantages of delegation that we have is one, it reduces the workload of the manager. Through delegation, a manager is able to reduce his or her workload by giving subordinates to perform some tasks. In this way, what the manager has to do is reduced. Number two, it makes work easier because of shared responsibilities. As a manager delegates performance of some of his or her duties to subordinate, work becomes easier. Work would become difficult to perform in the absence of delegation, as the manager will have so many things to do. Number three, it allows manager to concentrate on aspects of job which require her personal knowledge, experience, and skills. On this one, what I mean is delegation gives more time to the manager to concentrate on the aspects of the job which requires her personal knowledge and experience and skills thereby performing these tasks aspects better with an undivided attention. And number four, it promotes staff growth and development. Delegation requires that the manager explains how to perform the delegated task to the subordinates. This provides opportunity to the subordinate, acquire knowledge and skills about the delegated task, thereby contributing to staff growth and development. So as a recap, the four advantages that we have, we said, one, it reduces the workload of the manager. Two, it makes work easier because of shared responsibility. Three, 
It allows the manager to concentrate on aspects of job which require their personal knowledge, experience, and skills. And number four, it promotes staff growth and development. The disadvantages of delegation that we have is one, delegation is time-consuming. What does it mean? Delegation requires a considerable amount of time. As in some cases, managers may have to train staff to handle delegated tasks. Depending on the task, the training may take from a few minutes to several weeks. For simple tasks, managers may feel it is easier and faster to simply do the task themselves than to train staff to take on the responsibility. Disadvantage number two, delegation may result in low quality work. Delegation may result in low quality work. Managers need to delegate tasks that they have performed, that they have performed for a considerable period of time, which as I was saying, delegation may result in low quality work. Managers need to delegate, delegate tasks that they have performed for a considerable period of time, which has allowed them to gain experience and expertise in performing good quality work. Therefore, managers do lose some measure of quality when delegating tasks, especially to staff members who are unfamiliar with the work or who have little experience performing the task. What this simply means is, if you have been doing the work yourself and you have been doing it very well, when you tell someone to do the work, the quality can go down. That is what this point is saying. Disadvantage number three, delegation may lead to failure of task accomplishment. There are some tasks that require a certain amount of authority to accomplish. This authority may come in the form of being able to secure funds or get the cooperation of people in other departments. If a task is given to an employee who lacks the proper authority to secure the necessary resources, the delegation is likely to fail. And number four, delegation may result in loss of enjoyment for doing some tasks. Managers who truly love their work may find that delegating places some of their more enjoyable tasks in the hands of others. This downside to delegation can become even more frustrating when managers see their staff members doing work that the manager once enjoyed. And last one, delegation may result in loss of control over critical tasks. One disadvantage of delegating to employees is giving up control over tasks that should be done by the manager alone. Examples include conducting performance and salary reviews, as well as training, reprimanding, and terminating employees. In summary, these are the disadvantages of delegation. Number one, delegation is time consuming. Number two, delegation may result in low quality work. Number three, delegation may lead to failure of task accomplishment. Number four, delegation may result in loss of enjoyment for doing some task. And number five, delegation may result in loss of control over critical tasks. We move on to Part C, explain five qualities of a good manager. Explain five qualities of a good manager. Number one, a good manager is able to create a bond with their subordinates. And when they create a bond, this is where managers are able to lead by example. They can even demonstrate or show to a subordinate how work is done. Number two, Having a vision, a good manager has a vision. Being able to see the big picture and uh, as well as company goals. Number three, a good manager is able to develop talent that is not only meet the needs of their employees, but also see uh, their well-being in general. And number four, uh, continued learning. That is one of the quality of a good manager. They continue to learn and uh, especially in this new era of technology you find that as a manager a good manager is somebody who continues going to school getting degrees masters and having different uh, knowledge in other fields and number five communication communicating empathetically is also a good quality of a manager when a manager communicates empathically 
they are able to put themselves in the shoes of their subordinates. So these are some of the qualities of the subordinates. The others that we can talk about is number one, command respect, number two, exemplary character, number three, passion for their work, number four, trustworthy, number five, confident, and number six, function in an orderly manner. So these are all some of the examples that we have of a good manager. And then move on to part D. Being in charge of the world, you need to draw a duty roster. State five things you will consider when coming up with a timetable. The things that you are supposed to consider when you come up with a timetable. Number one, you need to look at staff skills and interest. Number two, you need to avoid understaffing. Number three, you need to balance shift or shift the workload. Number four, staff supervision and training needs. And number five, main hour job requirement. And number six, special request from staff. I will just explain in detail these points. On staff skills and interest, this factor is considered in line with patients' needs. All shifts must be adequately covered with skilled staff to meet the patient's needs. For example, it will be not proper to put new nurses in one shift who are still developing their skills. Number two, avoiding understaffing. The staff must be distributed appropriately across all shifts in terms of numbers so that artificial shortage of staff are avoided. For example, putting so many nurses on night duty may create some staff shortage when the nurses complete their night duty and go on nights off. Number three, shift workload. Some shifts are busier than others. For example, night shift is usually longer while morning shift is busier. I will therefore distribute the number of staff according to the workload to the shifts. Busier work shifts will be considered with more staff than less busy shifts. Number four, staff supervision and training needs. New staff may be deliberately be put in same shift with more experienced and skilled staff to the purpose of, for the purpose of supervising and mentoring. Then we have number five, main hour job requirement. Each member of staff has a minimum number of hours to work in a week. Uh, I will therefore factor in this requirement so all staff meet the minimum number of working in a week. And number six, special requests from staff. Some staff members may work, make special requests regarding work shift in order to enable them to attend to other issues. For example, evening classes, I'll consider this when making a duty roster. So these are the factors to consider. So these are the factors to consider when we make uh, a duty roster. We have come to the end of uh, this paper, ladies and gentlemen. I've tried to move a bit faster so that I'll be able to complete it on time. I've tried to explain in detail. If there's anyone with some questions with regard to this section D paper, you are free to send your questions for this specific section in the group. Uh, I will not be able to, to answer to specific individual requests for other different questions, but I will normally entertain those questions which are related to what I would have taken you through. I encourage you to tell others who need to learn leadership to join the group, and I hope to do another session very soon uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the continued support. I encourage you to continue reading and work hard. Leadership is not uh, that difficult, but if you put some effort into it, you surely do well. I have never had students who have failed leadership and management so far, and I hope among you guys who are listening to this video, no one will be the first one to fail leadership and management. Thank you very much for the support. Thank you very much for the participation. God bless and all the best.